Mueller finds some evidence of Trump colluding with the Russians where he knew or should have known, that would be probably it for me. Australia does not have a functioning government. Like almost any addiction, it's all about that dopamine rush. They're setting it up for us to fall into that trap. A U.S. District Court judge sentenced former NSA contractor Reality Winner to five years and three months in prison for leaking information about Russia's attempts to hack the 2016 presidential election. Winner's sentence is the longest ever given for a federal crime involving leaks to the media. South Africa's government responded angrily to President Trump after he tweeted that his administration would be looking into what he called farm seizures and expropriations and the large-scale killing of farmers. There's no scientific evidence that points to any uh, white genocide in South Africa. It's not true. He took the job and then he said, I'm going to recuse myself. I said, what kind of a man is this? And by the way, he was on the campaign. You know, the only reason I gave him the job because I felt loyalty. Attorney General Jeff Sessions is no stranger to public humiliation from his boss. But this time, Sessions pushed back with an official statement, saying his department, quote, would not be improperly influenced by political considerations. Following a report that found systemic deficiencies in how Chicago's public schools handled incidents of sexual abuse by its staff, the Chicago Board of Education approved new policies restricting how workers and students can communicate with each other. They're now prohibited from calling, leaving voicemails or texting on personal devices, or contacting each other using personal email addresses or social media accounts. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse and Lindsey Graham are on a bipartisan crusade about the cyber hacking of American elections. I came here today to talk to them about it. But I know what you want to hear about, so before we got to cyber stuff, I asked Graham, one of the managers of the 1999 impeachment trial of Bill Clinton, about the standard for impeachment, given all of President Trump's recent unpleasantness. He wasn't shy about it. There's some comments you made back in 1999 that are back in the news today for some reason. So the point I'm trying to make is you don't even have to be convicted of a crime to lose your job in this constitutional republic. Impeachment is about cleansing the office. Impeachment is about restoring honor and integrity to the office. So don't you think those words apply today? I don't think they always apply, and finally somebody's listening. It took 20 years, so welcome to the dance. Here's the deal. Uh, once Mueller issues his report, one thing I learned about impeachment, there's sort of two models here. There's the Nixon model, where it just got overwhelming, and there was just too much to ignore, and the Republican Party said, okay, you gotta go. There's the Clinton model, where it, to many people, was an overreach, that it was all about sex, and the party never abandoned President Clinton and most independents said uh, they didn't like what he did, but uh, bridge too far. That's what would happen here. Uh, if Mueller finds some evidence of Trump colluding with the Russians where he knew or should have known, that would be probably it for me. Other stuff, not so much. So not the stuff we've been hearing about this week? Well, that's I, not I, enough for I you. think that's not going to change many people's minds in terms of is that a, an event to, to throw the guy out? their yeah. campaign finance stuff. Yeah. And Senator, we're in your office. What do you think of that answer? I think Lindsey was right then, and he's right now. Back to cybersecurity and the senator's attempts to tell a story about cyber threats that America will finally pay attention to. Today, these guys convinced me that you should be worried about that. Help me understand how serious it is, like the power grid. Is it safe? No. The water system, safe? Safer, because it's a simpler system. There's a lot of gravity flow and feed and things like that. What about the 2018 election? Is that going to be safe? Probably the actual vote tallies will be correct. This has been mostly an information operation uh, by the Russians, so the extent to which they can sow divisions 
weaponize fake news and fire it at us and do those things is still very much a current problem. We really are exposed in terms of our voter registration files of them being purged, people being added. Uh, anything computerized uh, can be attacked. What I worry about is just a major Pearl Harbor cyber attack on the financial telecommunication uh, energy side that puts us in the dark, takes our daily lives, throws us in complete chaos. And that's going to happen until the bad actors believe it costs too much to do it. I think the Trump administration is not sending a better signal than the Obama administration. The way you address this is to go after Putin's oligarchs that the support system for the Putin regime is that pack of thieves and looters that are his oligarchs. And the thing they want more than anything else is to find safety in London, in New York, to be able to escape the wicked world that they have looted and to deny them rule of law world will have a very powerful effect. The new phrase that came from the hearing is kick them in the oligarchs. I sort of like that. <laughs> Shouldn't you pass a law saying every power grid's got to have this kind of protection or else we're doing something about it? The problem is that two weeks from now, there's a new iteration on what we told them they had to do, and that's now obsolete. What Sheldon's doing is saying, let's pick the five or six critical infrastructure pieces that would destroy our life if they were brought down and encourage those people in these business areas to harden their infrastructure and keep, keep hardening it. You know, I'm like willing to kill a bunch of people to make us safe. <laughs> I'm pretty out there. I mean, I'm willing to leave troops in Afghanistan as long as we need. I'm willing to be hard on the terrorists. Um, but you're not going to win this war by killing people. I understand there's a limit to military power. I am very worried about how bad actors without large armies could do a lot of damage to the country. And we're not responding. Dan Coates said, the warning lights are blinking red in the cyber area and we're just not moving fast enough. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, Kyle. You done. Done. Good, Good to see you. you. Take care. Australians will be rightly appalled by what they're witnessing in their nation's parliament today and in the course of this week. Actually, Australian voters have been appalled for quite a long time. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull may be about to lose a bitter fight to save his leadership job from insurgents in his own party. It's the second internal challenge to Turnbull in just one week. The first was on Tuesday, when Peter Dutton, a right-winger in Turnbull's Liberal Party, which is actually conservative, resigned his cabinet post and challenged his boss for the top job. Dutton lost that contest. Thank you very much. But just 24 hours later, he was back, calling for another vote. And after which two more candidates put themselves forward for the job. Turnbull agreed to schedule a second vote, which is set to take place just a few hours from now. If one of his three challengers can break the deadlock in the party ballot, there will be a new leader of the Liberal Party immediately and a new Prime Minister of Australia. Australians call an internal leadership challenge a spill. As a cabinet minister in 2015, Turnbull himself challenged his own boss, then Prime Minister Tony Abbott, in two leadership spills only six months apart. He won on the second try. This is the new normal in Australian politics, on both sides. What have we got? We've got this spectacle, this disgrace. Left-wing Prime Minister Kevin Rudd was knifed by his deputy Prime Minister Julia Gillard, who was later knifed by her foreign secretary, Kevin Rudd. Rudd became Prime Minister twice, before losing power in a general election. All told, in the past 11 years, not a single Prime Minister has survived to serve a full three-year term. And of course, will be an election of this broken government. Australia does not have a functioning government. What's driving all this chaos? It's not actually widespread discontent. Australia's economy, for example, is relatively strong. And right now, most voter frustration is aimed squarely at Parliament. You absolute shitlords. Do, do your, your fucking, fucking job. Authorised by all Australians wanting you to do your fucking job. The actual culprit here seems to be a national fixation on opinion polls, particularly the news poll, which regularly gauges party preference. Back when Turnbull was challenging Abbott, he said 30 consecutive polls showing that voters preferred the other party made Abbott illegitimate. When Turnbull hit the same mark in April, he said, it's not about the numbers. But the vultures started circling. 
If Turnbull goes down, and it looks like he will, another general election is likely to happen soon. The Liberal and Labor parties will compete for votes, as they always do. But what's clear in today's Australia is that the greatest threat to Prime Ministers isn't their opposition. It's their own government. Tomorrow, shareholders will vote on whether health insurer Cigna should acquire Express Scripts for $67 billion. The deal is expected to go through. Express Scripts is the country's largest pharmacy benefit manager, or PBM. Express Scripts, CVS Caremark, and OptumRx are the three biggest PBMs in the U.S., and they control about 80% of the market. But what is a PBM? And why would an insurance company want to spend $67 billion to buy one? A PBM is like a bouncer at the bar. A bouncer is a middleman. They control who gets into the bar and who doesn't, and they get paid to do it. That's pretty much what PBMs do in the drug industry. They're the middlemen in almost every transaction. PBMs process prescription claims for insurers. They help determine which drugs get covered by insurance, how much insurers will pay for them, and how big your personal copay will be. And they influence which pharmacies people like you end up using. And, like bouncers, PBMs have lists. They help decide which drugs insurance companies will or won't cover and determine how much you pay for your pills. PBMs say that these lists help patients get medicine at competitive prices. But having drugs on these lists can also be good for drug companies, since it often leads to more prescriptions. For certain drugs, when you fill your prescription, drug makers pay PBMs a cut, called a rebate, which can drive up earnings for the PBM. The Department of Health and Human Services says that PBM rebates incentivize drug makers to keep prices high. PBMs claim that rebates aren't the reason for high drug prices. They say drug makers are, since they alone set the cost. But this is difficult to verify, since PBMs' pricing and negotiation practices are totally opaque. In addition to determining which pills will be covered for patients, PBMs also set reimbursement rates for pharmacies. But some pharmacists say that these reimbursement rates are sometimes set so low that pharmacies can lose money when they fill prescriptions. This puts small independent pharmacists like Dominic Bartone at a disadvantage. We have no negotiating power with the PBM. PBM provides us a contract, and basically the contract is take it or leave it. Pharmacists say that because of their PBM contracts, there are times when patients' co-pays for a drug are so high that it'd be cheaper for them to just pay out of pocket. But according to some pharmacists, these contracts often prohibit them from telling patients that it'd be cheaper to pay cash. The Pharmaceutical Care Management Association, which represents the PBM industry, say they oppose contracts that conceal the cash price of a drug. I always equate it to the restaurant with no prices on the menu. You know that you're not getting a deal when the prices aren't listed on the menu. That's exactly how we pay for prescription drugs. Last year, Anthem, the second largest health insurer in the U.S., cut ties with Express Scripts, saying it was being overcharged by billions of dollars. Express Scripts told Vice News that Anthem's claims lack merit. Arkansas recently became the first state to pass legislation regulating PBMs. And United Healthcare and Aetna made a move towards more transparency, saying they'd pass drug company rebates directly to customers in efforts to bring down prices. That could mean the heyday of PBMs is passing. But it might also just mean insurance companies will become the new power brokers. Anthem, for example, is creating its own PBM. CVS plans to merge with Aetna. And there's that Cigna Express Scripts deal we mentioned. The companies say these deals will help them cut costs and deliver care more efficiently. But consumer advocates say they'll just reduce competition and are unlikely to make your prescriptions cheaper which isn't good news for independent pharmacies, or for you. The World Championships for the video game Dota 2 are underway in Vancouver. And the purse for the tournament is now more than $25 million, the highest in esports history. Gaming is huge business, 
but it's also becoming a public health issue. Last month, the World Health Organization made gaming disorder an official disease. The question now is how to treat it. Restart is the first video game addiction rehab in the United States. It's treated over 275 gaming addicts since it started nine years ago and currently has a waiting list to get in. I was playing up to 12, 13 hours a day, maybe even more, and I, I didn't keep track. You just kind of minimize it. Barely going out to eat, barely going out to interact with anyone at all, just on the damn computer, and just not caring about anything else. Even now, it's still kind of hard to say, I really did that, and think to yourself, wow, I'm a bit of an ass. These are two patients at Restart. They were sent here by their parents after they failed out of college. Do you think people, if you told them about Restart, that there's a whole facility just for gaming addiction, they'd be surprised? They'd be surprised, and also they'd probably get a bit angry. The reaction of, oh, you're just a baby. Why don't you just grow up and mature? Which, um, could you imagine saying that to an alcoholic? You can't just get over it. It takes a lot of effort and work. The first phase is this intensive phase where they have no access to digital media. Okay. This is a chore chart, and they, um, these chores uh, rotate every week. <laughs> Hillary Cash founded Restart and is the chief clinical officer of the program. Yeah, and so these are the bedrooms. This is just one of the guy's bedrooms. Uh, no screens. No screens. Phase one includes a minimum of an eight-week detox from technology. No phones, no screens, and no contact with the outside world. The WHO's classification of gaming disorder is good news for Hillary. It's a long-awaited nod from the medical establishment that gaming addiction could be as bad as she says it is. People tend to think it can't be real, but they are misled because if you're a gaming addict and you're actively gaming, your brain is going to light up the same way someone who's high on cocaine, the same way their brain lights up. Cash has a point. Gaming companies hire psychologists to help design their games to be more fun and to hook people to play for longer. Some studies have shown that gaming can cause structural changes in the reward systems of addicts' brains. Tell me about your patients. Who are they and what are their backgrounds? Most of them are fall between 18 and 30. They come from nice families. They have uh, had many privileges of a middle-class life, usually. You talk about middle class. How much does Restart cost? For most people who stay for about eight weeks here, it costs about 30000 And That's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But that's just phase one of the program. The price is higher than some drug rehabs. The difference is this isn't covered by insurance. We are going to my job. I've been in phase two for four weeks. I got a job in the first week. And I wanted a job. Um, so that I can kind of progress through the phases faster. How are you doing today? Kevin ended up at Restart after his parents gave him an ultimatum. Get help or get out of the house. He's now in the program's outpatient phase, which it calls open world. I may be almost 30 years old, but I'm not, I've never actually functioned as a true adult. I, you know, pay all my own bills, you know, go to things on time, make my own food, things like that. Those are all things that I've never fully accomplished. Oh, the erotica books. Did Mary show you where the No. Time? Once in a while. <laughs> Mostly guys, sometimes girls. For a little over $7,000 a month, Kevin's parents pay for him to live in a halfway house for gamers and receive daily therapy to slowly integrate tech back into his life. He's only allowed to have a flip phone and has to petition his therapist for a smartphone. So I use a computer about once a week. Um, you basically have to sign up more, like more than 24 hours in advance to make it intentional use of the computer. Um, I mean, in the past, I always used computer just because I wanted to use computer. Now, um, kind of make everything in my life intentional. It changes the impulsivity of things. We're gonna be heading off to Jewel Park, hanging out, building social bonds. 
lot of psychologists and research that's being dumped into trying to prove that it's not a problem when people that I've seen, I've seen for years. You see it every day. I see it every day. I had a guy telling me like how he, his bathroom just had mushrooms growing in it because he hadn't cleaned his tub. We reached out to five major game developers and they all referred us to the industry's lobbying arm, the Entertainment Software Association. The ESA has declined our repeated requests for an interview, but its representatives have gone on the record calling the World Health Organization's scientific process, quote, deeply flawed. Other academics have pushed back on the WHO's classification, saying that there isn't enough evidence to single out gaming. Are there other ways to treat gaming addiction that aren't like an intensive rehab program? I mean, that's the question, and I think part of it does have to do with earlier interventions. You know, the World Health Organization just recognized it, but in America as a whole, it's not recognized. None of this is enough to convince American game developers to rethink their product. They're the ones who are pushing all of this onto the general population to make money. So it's not in their interest to admit that there is a serious problem. Like almost any addiction, it's all about that dopamine rush. It's kind of built into the game. They're setting it up for us to fall into that trap. Do you think you'll ever game again? I'd love to get back, but it's just... I'm an addict. It's in my blood. They've left it up to a six-year-old to explain what transgender means because the school district's too afraid of actually having the adults teach the children. Up until the day that laws are changed, people are gonna always kill trans people and feel like they can get away with it because it's being justified. She's not at higher risk because she's trans. She's at higher risk because we're allowing this bigotry and, and prejudice to continue. <laughs> 